Gopi Jana Bala Ba Jaya Giri Vardhari Jaya Giri Vardhari Jayo Radha Madhava Jayo Kunja Bihari Jashora Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jashora Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jai Shora Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jai Shora Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Jamuna Tira Vana Chari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Jayam Vishnu Par Paramahangsa Paribraja Kachari Stathara Satya Shri Srimad His Divine Grace Le A.C. Bhakti Branta Swami Maharaj Shri Prabhupada Ki Iskan Founder Acharya Shri Prabhupada Ki Ananta Koti Vaishnava Rinda Ki Nama Acharya Shri Haridas Thakura Ki Prem Sega Hosiri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityana Dashi Adwaita Garadhar Shri Vas Ari Gaura Bhakti Branda Ki Shri Shri Radha Krishna Go Gopakabina Shamakunda Radha Kundigiri Govardhana Ki Shri Vrindavan Dhamma Ki Shri Mayapur Dhamma Ki Ganga Mai Ki Jumuna Mai Ki Bhakti Devi Ki Tulasi Devi Ki Sama Veta Bhakti Vrindu Ki Jai Nitai Gaur Premanandi All Glories to Samu Devotees All Glories to Samu Devotees All Glories to Samu Devotees All Glories to Shri Guru and Shri Gaur and All Glories to Shri Lepa Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Gajendra Bhagavat Sparashad Vimukto Jnana Bhandhanat Prapto Bhagavato Rupam Pita Vasash Chatur Bhujaha 
Gajendra Bhagavad Sparsha Vimukto Jnana Bandanata Prapto Bhagavato Rupam Pita Vasas Chatur Bujaha Gajendra Bhagavad Sparsha Vimukto Jnana Bhandanata Prapto Bhagavato Rupam Pita Vashas Chatur Bujaha Gajendra, the king of the elephants, Gajendra, Bhagavat Sparashat, because of being touched by the hand of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vimuktaha was immediately freed, Ajnana Bandhanat, from all kinds of ignorance especially the bodily concept of life. Praptaha, achieved. Bhagavata, of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Rupam, the same bodily features. P 
Pita Vasha, wearing yellow garments, Chatu Bujaha, and four handed, with conch shell, disc, club, and lotus. Translation Because Gajendra, king of the elephants, had been touched directly by the hands of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He was immediately freed from all material ignorance and bondage. Thus he received the sal salvation of Sarupya Mukti, in which he achieved the same bodily features as the Lord, being dressed in yellow garments and possessing four hands. Purport. If one is favored by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, by having his gross body touched by the Lord, his body turns into a spiritual body, and he can go back home, back to Godhead. Gajendra assumed the spiritual body when his body was touched by the Lord. Sim similarly, Dhruva Maharaj assumed his spiritual body in this way. Archanapadati, daily worship of the deity, provides an opportunity to touch the body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And thus it enables one to be fortunate enough to get a spiritual body and, go b and to go back to Godhead. Not only by touching the body of the Supreme Lord, but, uh, but simply by hearing about his pastimes, chanting his glories, touching his feet, and offering worship. In other words, by serving the Lord somehow or other, one is purified of material contamination. This is the result of touching the Supreme Lord. One who is a pure devotee, anyavi lashita shunyam, who acts according to the Shastra and the words of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, certainly becomes purified, like Gajendra, he assumes a spiritual body and returns home back to Godhead. So the basic principle of, of uh, benefit here is coming in contact with the Lord. That aspect, by coming in contact with the Lord, then that's the beginning of actual all auspiciousness. Everything is connected to the Lord, but until we see it like that, we don't actually get the benefit. Because right? that's what illusion means. We think things aren't connected to the Lord. That's the meaning of maya, that which is not. We think it's not connected to the Lord, it's just connected to me. I can do with it as I like. That's the illusion. No, it's all connected to the Lord. So if we don't see it in connection to the Lord, that's the illusion. So at that point where the living entity starts to see it in connection with the Lord, that's the beginning of all auspiciousness. So here then Gajendra, by uh, being absorbed in the Lord, then in that case, then he got benefit. And we see the Gandharva, he gets his benefit by having come back to his position as a Gandharva, then how that happened, then he sees this by the Lord's grace. Then uh, appreciating that mercy, surrenders to the Lord, and then he also attains the transcendental position. So this position of the spiritual, the spiritual is basically, you can say, it's not, it's not a location. We tend to, means there is the aspect of, okay, here's the material world and there's the spiritual world. So that, as, that is there. But actually the spiritual world is, is a... Uh, an attitude of that surrender to the Lord. When that attitude is there, that's when one is actually situated spiritually. Because we see that the, uh, even though they're within the Braj Mandal, the, uh, the, Brahm, the Yagic Brahmins, their wives, they're there. But the wives appreciate the Lord's position. They surrender. The husbands don't. And even after they understand his position and see how foolish they were, they can't make that endeavor to actually go and surrender to the Lord. They're too worried about their social position. So that establishes the point. It's not about the, it's not about the gross body and, and like this. It's not that having a spiritual body, that that's perfection. Because there's the concept of surup siddhi. I have my form, so that's the siddhi. No, that's the surup. Siddhi is when in touch with the Lord, one gives up all material considerations. At that point, it's considered you have a spiritual body. That's surup siddhi. So when one sees everything in connection to the Lord and has no other purpose than to please the Lord, that's the spiritual form. 
It's not based on what body you happen to be in. It's your mentality in which you deal with that body. That's actually the position. So then, for us, practically it means if we surrender to the Lord and see everything connected to the Lord, we can actually be acting on the spiritual platform. But if we don't do that, then the material platform will be still functioning. So it's, it's not a matter of, well, I'll just do whatever I'm doing now and somehow or another by magic then I'll be in a spiritual body and it'll all work out. Yes, on one platform, that's how it'll work. But the point is, is it's about when we surrender to Krishna. That's the whole point. So here, Gajendra, he's surrendering to Krishna. And because of that, then he's coming to this perfectional platform. So that opportunity is given for everybody. They take shelter of the holy name, surrender to the order of the spiritual master, the previous acharyas. Then we're actually able to function on the spiritual platform. Because that platform means we're free from the tendency towards the material difficulties. Right? Cheating propensity, imperfect senses, uh, illusion, and what's the other one? Hmm? Mistakes, yes. Yeah, see there, can't even remember as you make a mistake. I've always noticed whenever you have a list, you can always remember all of them except the last one. Doesn't matter which one you start one, you'll, you'll forget the last one. Right? You, know. you know, we change the order of this and still you'd forget the last one. Yeah. So that's, that's the symptom, making mistakes. So, the, um, this principle of understanding, then it's, it's a sobering aspect is that all I have to do is be Krishna conscious. That's perfection. It's not the situation I'm in. Because we'll take it, oh, it's the spiritual world, so everything's perfect. Right? No, it's about what we do with the spiritual situation that makes it perfect. Because the demons also came into Vrindavan. They're in the spiritual world. It means by location. But by consciousness, they're still in the material world. Right? And then Arjuna, he's on the battle of Kurukshetra. So we're not counting that as the Tom, but he's in transcendental consciousness, so he's in the spiritual world. So that's the whole position. If you see things in connection with Krishna, we're all situated spiritually. And if we don't, then to that degree, then there's material. And to that degree, we see it connected to Krishna, it's spiritual. Because the living entity has both bodies at once. The spiritual body is covered by the gross body. So now it's just a matter of which one you want to use. Do we want to use the spiritual intelligence or material? We want to use the spiritual mind and senses or material? We want to use the spiritual mind. How, what do we want to use? So that's the actual position. So it's a matter of consciousness. It's not a matter of the externals. Otherwise, then we work that if the externals are per perfect, that will make bhakti, but that can't B, because bhakti being independent of um, bhakti being independent of karma and jnana, it's not based on that. It's not dependent upon that. So that's that's the position. Is that it doesn't it, the externals isn't the thing. It's what you do with it. Like Prabhupada was explaining before, is that the devotees they're in their various situations. And it may be in a dangerous situation, so they don't blame the Lord because in that dangerous situation they will tend to think of him more. So actually it's a better situation because you're absorbed in Krishna. So it's not about the externals. Like that. You can be in a very nice situation or not and, and it's a matter of whether you remember Krishna or not. That's the whole point. So whatever allows you to remember, then that's, that's the best situation. But it's not that the situation generates that. Does that make sense? Like that. Whatever situational things are there, that's what's recommended by the acharyas. Come to the temple, you associate with the devotees, uh, take prasad, chant Hare Krishna, live in the dham. These may be situational, but these then you are directly interacting with the Lord. So these situational are good, but when we're dealing with secondary situational, indirect activities, then those activities, those aren't guaranteed that they're going to make it more Krishna conscious. 
but that we try to make the secondary Krishna conscious, then that's very good. Then that's, 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 that's our uh, focus or determination that we want to see everything connected to Krishna. So in that way, that's good. That's how it's good. But it itself is not actually the determining factor. It's the mentality that I'm trying to make my material situation into something Krishna conscious. So it's that Krishna conscious attitude that makes it perfect. It has actually nothing to do with the situation itself. Does that make sense? So that's why then, if we're going to choose situations, we have to choose according to what's recommended what the acharyas give us, because those situations, those are going to be, yes, material situations, but they're going to be such that by engaging in those, you have the best chance for remembering things, remembering the Lord. Well, in other situations that others may say, uh, but the point is, is the others who say, what position are they in? What's their purpose of those situations? They're mundane. Therefore, there's no guarantee that the situation will help. If we're Krishna conscious, okay, we can make it. But if we're not, then it's a double loss. Well, if we're in situations that are recommended, then by being in that, we're chanting, we're hearing, we're associating, we're worshiping the Lord. Then these, even if we're not conscious, we still get benefit. Right? We're in Mayapur, we get benefit. Right? We're tired, we lay down to take a nap because we're tired, but you get the benefit of having offering obeisances. Right? We happen to be, after class, walking very quickly to the Maha place to make sure we get something before everybody else does. We're only worried about you know, what we're going to eat, but we get the benefit of that walking of Parikram, whether we're aware of it or not. So that's, that's the benefit of following what the Acharyas give, because they're perfect. We follow their instructions, then it becomes perfect. But if we make up our own, then we have to be very careful. Because if we're not Krishna conscious in our made up situations, then we lose from all sides. Like that. We always have to remember, because if we made them up, there's a good chance that they came from one of four positions, right? Illusion, mistakes, cheating, and imperfect senses. Okay, we got them all. Right? It'll come from those four, because that's why we chose them. Right? Now, if it's in pursuit of what the Acharyas give us, and we try to bring it as close as possible, because we can't always get that. We're in the middle of nowhere, there's no devotees, so then through the books, through uh, you know, the internet, we contact devotees, we maintain that. Yes, then it's in pursuance of the order of the previous Acharyas. But if we do something else, you know, I say, you know, we sit around reading man in the, you know, the man in the sea or something, then we may not be getting that uh, deep Vaishnava association that we were expecting to get, right? Even though the man is very focused and very determined, and I mean, he's walking around on one leg, right? You know, you got to be focused to do that stuff. You're on a boat, right? It's not level like we're walking on. Like that. So you'd be able to be able to stand there, focus there, and do all these things like that. You know, great determination, great good qualities. But why is that there? Simply false ego. So that association may not give us the benefit that we're looking for, even though so many nice qualities are there. Right? Because the point is, is the situation is there, then the qualities and attitude you use to apply that situation but just because it's more subtle doesn't mean it's spiritual. That's something very important. Just because it's good doesn't mean it's spiritual. Somebody's nice, somebody's pleasant, you know, having whatever the good qualities that people appreciate of the day, but that doesn't make it spiritual. In the modern context, yes, that's spiritual. Oh, he cares for others, that's spiritual. I had such a spiritual experience when I was, you know, there and the, wherever it was, the Congo, distributing, you know, mosquito nets to all those, you know, children that don't have, aren't so, it was such a spiritual experience, right? And go on the internet, find millions of such, you know, examples. That if there's a good quality as opposed to it's just about myself and I'm a total rat bag, if it's above that standard, then I call it spiritual. But we have to be careful that that's not spiritual. That's just nice qualities. 
right? It means I do an activity with good qualities. That gives a nice experience. I get a good result and a good experience. That combination is to be offered to Krishna. If it's not offered to Krishna, it's still not spiritual, right? So if I cook something in the right attitude and then offer it to Krishna, or I cook something in the right, wrong attitude, you know, or I cook it in the right attitude, don't offer it to Krishna. It's still, then it's, the, the difference is, if I do it for Krishna, it's spiritual. If I don't, it's material. So it's not that the, the attitude is in support of the proper action to get the result for Krishna. So we have to see is that this attitude is a very, very important thing. And so the acharyas give us that attitude. Lord Chaitanya gives us that attitude, that humility, tolerance, respect of others, not looking for respect. You know, doing everything to please Krishna. This is the attitude. So with that kind of thing and the qualities that go along with that, then the service becomes nice. But if we focus just on the qualities or just on the skill, we've actually missed the point. I mean, actually, like, totally. Because there's tons of people who are good at action or knowledge or good at attitude. Right? There's even animals that are nice. Consider it. Right? It happens. So... Therefore, that's not the position. The position is then when all that is connected to the Lord. Right. Yes. So, then that's, so the idea is that those things that will be helpful to us, the acharyas give us, like Prabhupada mentions, archan padati, so the worship of the deity, the samkirtan mission, the association of the devotees, living in the dham, all these different aspects then are uh, the important elements. Prabhupada, when he first started the movement, this is where it started from. Chanting the holy name, hearing Bhagavatam and the association of devotees, living in a spiritual place, right? And then, you know, some, and, and worshipping Krishna. So this is what he gave in the beginning. And then from there, you just expand the detail to support that. It's not that it replaces that, that these things are old. No, these are the real things. Everything else is just in support. These five are the thing. Everything else is to help us appreciate that or practice that. That's all it's for. So if we, appreciate, if we can uh, somehow another focus on this in a, in a very specific way, then we see that, um, then we, our, our direction is very clear. Otherwise, we can get distracted by all the various knowledges there, various skills, various qualities, various identities. You know, and our endeavors to get specific results. But if that is not connected to Krishna, results, all that process has no meaning. And as soon as it's connected to Krishna, then it becomes perfect. Okay. Any questions or comments? Yes. All the way back. Microphone. Thingy, majiggy. Thank you, Maharaj, for a very nice uh, class. Uh, you spoke about uh, the need to discriminate between just good and spiritual so that we don't get distracted. And it seems like, from my experience, is that we tend to oscillate between two extremes. One is everything good is extremely spiritual. And sometimes also, if it's not connected to Krishna, there may be some good we completely... So how do we um, find that balance so we don't become adverse and at the same time, we don't get uh, distracted and enamored with the mundane unnecessarily. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, the main point is to avoid distraction means we have to always keep the focus on Krishna. What is the purpose for? See, it's because something's running. It's running in a parallel here. The identity, the knowledge, the skill, and the result, that's all working in one well, let's say, let's say more the skill, knowledge, skill, activity, 
end result gained from applying that knowledge and skill in an activity. That's one thing that comes. And we'll see especially as, you know, generally on the material platform, that's the general focus, but we'll see in, in the more contemporary context, it's basically really focused on that. Then you have another aspect where it's the attitude, the mood, uh, the inspiration that's there. And then, th so that generates the experience. You understand? So I can use proper knowledge, proper skill, apply it properly, get the proper result that I'm expecting. But if the attitude isn't good, the experience of that result is not good. My attitude's proper, it gives a proper experience. Because the whole reason for doing something is the experience, ultimately. Because what will the soul gain from anything external? Right? The soul's not gaining from having a material body. So therefore, anything connected to that material body also will not give a proper result for the soul. Right? So you have these two parallel aspects. But these are still secondary. These are still secondary because one's subtle and one's gross. But the actual point, the spiritual, is if it's connected to Krishna or not. Are we doing it to please Krishna? So is the knowledge in line with what Krishna, how he appreciates it, how it's being used, the identity and all that? Is the attitude we're using, the inspiration, is that appreciated by Krishna? Is the result that we're trying to get for him also appreciated by Krishna? Then all that together means then Krishna's satisfaction. Right? So, so, understand? so that would be pure devotional service. Mixed means it's ultimately for Krishna, but in the, the knowledge or the identity or the attitude or the results, I'm involved myself in that I want that benefit from that. But at the same time as I am offering it to Krishna. So that would be called mixed devotional service. So all these, these things where it's our consideration of ourselves and our position and the needs that are there, that will be the mixed part. But though we connect it to Krishna, then we get purified, we get elevated. And so as long as it's understood that mixed devotional service is, is a practical way to apply ourselves, but it is in a lesser position than pure devotional service. And it's, you know, a, how you say, a necessary evil for the conditioned soul until they get to the point of advanced devotional service where now that's not so much important. It can be pure, though, the, you know, then, then it's okay. But if we start to identify and uh, pr pr profess that this mixed devotional service is actually the standard and it's better than pure devotional service because it's more natural, it's being real, it's being me, when all this real me and everything is all illusion because the me is the soul, not the conditioning. So as soon as, as soon as we start talking about being natural, then you know that you're dealing with something wrong here. Unless you're talking about it's natural for the soul to be Krishna conscious, that's all right. But any other kind of aspect where we're emphasizing being natural, then we're dealing with, a, we're dealing with natural means for our conditioning. We're dealing with illusion here. So one has to be, be careful that one understands all these different things that are happening. There's the spiritual, there's the subtle, and then there's the gross. And within subtle, you have the qualities that are there, but you also have in between the subtle and the spiritual, the metaphysical, which generally is avoided. Why things are functioning, what modes are controlling them, what's going on, so that the principle of the quality, the principle of the knowledge, the principle of the activity are appreciated. And then we can see how does that match for serving Krishna. So the point is, is just because we can't make the mistake that I'm a devotee, I do devotional service, right? A equals B. And so therefore, anything that I do is devotional service. That actually doesn't add up as a logical syllogism. Right? If I'm following what the authority gives and all that, trying to please Krishna, yes, it's devotional service. But if I take it that automatically anything I do is devotional service, then we've, we've again missed the point. Because who's the I in this case? Right? You understand? So these things are very important to be able to distinguish between. 
especially as we go up in the cantos, we'll see the, the, the finity between these points is being made more and more specific. Because otherwise, how will we be able to distinguish what's pure devotional service and what's mixed? In the beginning, it's just what's devotional service and what's maya. But with time, it has to be what's, what's pure devotional service and what's mixed. Right? And then once you get to pure devotional service, then on the highest platform, is it on the platform of prema? Like that. Does, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hey, back there. Next to you. The mic. Do you have the mic? Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Um, Maharaj, uh, how we can understand the transcendental matter which is connected with the Supreme Lord? The transcendental matter. Matters means transcendental subjects. S transcendental subjects, okay. Which is connected with the Supreme Lord by studying Vedas. The Lord says that Vedas Sarve Ahmeva Vedya. So also in before he said that Traigunya Bisaya Veda Nistraigunya Bhavarjuna. So the Vedas will help us to understand Supreme Lord, his transcendental nature. So, uh, so, uh, so, this is the doubt about Veda, right? That the Veda is supposed to help us, but the Veda is, is describing the three modes of nature, so therefore how can we get help from the Veda? And so then, what's your alternative? You know, Stardust Magazine, or... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What, what else are you going to use, you know? Unless you're more contemporary, then you could use Time or Newsweek, I guess. If you, you know. So the whole point is, is people are in the modes of nature. So the Vedas are describing these things and how it's there. But the purpose of the Veda is describing Krishna. It's just that the form that it's using, just like let's say we take Ayurveda. Ayurveda is actually just talking about Krishna and the relationship of the living entity with Krishna. But it's using the medium of medicine and health and the situations that the body and is in and mind to discuss those connections. So the metaphysical and then the, the attitudes, the physical and things like that. So the volume of it is uh, about how to connect things to Krishna. All right? It means, means that what is the actual mechanics of connecting it? but not so much the philosophy. Philosophy is there, but it's not the, the focus because of the medium. So the Veda is also, it gives all the knowledge, everything's there. It's showing how everything is, is connected to the Lord, but it's showing all the connections. And so the Upanishads, then they explain, you know, the actual philosophical point. So for looking for how, it means, what's the philosophy? That's the Upanishads. The metaphysics, that's your Aranyakas. If we want to know the rituals, that's the Brahmanas. Right? And then all the stories and all that, that all that is being described in, that's the Samhita. Right? So the, the Samhita, the Veda, is describing everything all, in all its connection with Krishna. But the problem is, as, as Nard Muni pointed out, the Vyasadeva, people will get distracted by the secondary and not catch the primary. You know, it's just like, of the verses of the Mahabharat, then a hundred thousand, only twenty-five thousand are about the interaction of the Pandavas and Krishna. Right? So that means seventy-five thousand are about other stories that are given in support of the lifestyle and, and activities of the Pandavas. Then within those things, then how many of them are showing that direct devotion to Krishna? So... He's, uh, Nard Muni is pointing out, people will get distracted. So that's why then, if you focus on just the body of the Vedas, then the tendency is to come up with karma mimamsa. But if you focus on the Vedanta, I mean on the Upanishads, then you get the purva mimamsa, or Vedanta. But even that, unless it's appreciated, in connection with Krishna and devotion, one will, will only appreciate the aspect of the liberation of the soul. That's as far as most people understand it. 
But for the devotees, then they don't have a problem because they see everything connected to Krishna. So for them, whatever literature they're reading, they can see its connection to Krishna. So that's why then Srimad Bhagavatam then makes it very obvious. It's all connected to Krishna, every syllable. And so then it's just a matter of understanding what the Acharyas are saying. So the Vedas then are the, the root of everything. But we see is how the Acharyas give us that understanding of following the Vedas. That's the important aspect. Does that work? Maharaj, then what is the meaning of Nistre Gunya means? Nistre Gunya. Let us refer to Vedas. Or and how are you translating that? Three from the three modes of nature? Yes. So being freed from three modes of nature is not a good thing? It's the Vedas are three modes of nature, so it refers to... Didn't we just explain all that? You have to... Means, means you ask a question, you listen. But if you're looking for, no, and it's going to be a whole grammatical display of the words Nistrigunya and all that, then you're going to run into problems. See, is that asking a question means that you want an answer to move forward in Krishna consciousness. If you just want to discuss some technical point because the technical point, whether, whatever it is, intellectual, social, uh, you know, about the, how you say, economics or political, whatever it is that is your taste, that that's what you want to taste from studying the scriptures. So we have to listen to what's going on here. Means they're explaining how the modes are working. Now, you understand the purpose, then you engage it in Krishna's service. You're not under the modes, you're working with the modes. But if you're not doing it for Krishna, then you're under the modes. So it just depends on the same principle. Are you using the Veda to please Krishna or not? And if you are, then that's transcendental. And if it's not, then you're under the modes. Does this make sense? Point is, is you have to be the the idea of doubts is I'm trying to apply this in devotional service in my life practically, and I come into something I can't figure out how to make it work, and so that's where the doubt comes up. And then that kind of doubting is, is useful. It's one of the things. Prabhupada said one should not be, um, how you say, yeah, blindly accept and all that. It shouldn't be sentimental. One should intellectually appreciate it or be committed to it. So one of the functions of the intelligence is doubt, right? And then because you're trying to apprehend things properly. But we have to be careful that if there's misapprehension, then the doubts we're working with aren't actually doubts, they're misgivings. Misgivings is, it's not about the intellectual, it's not about the logic, it's about I have an attachment, and therefore no amount of logic is going to correct the situation, how I view it. So, therefore, that kind of question isn't, I mean, it's a good question because for most others they just have a doubt and then by, by answering the question then the larger assembly will get benefit but the person who asked the question may not get any benefit. But if it's, a, if it's a decent question then it can be answered for the benefit of everybody else. Right? So therefore that's why when you reiterate the question it's already been understood by everybody else and so there's no need to go further with it because then we're dealing with a misgiving rather than a doubt because why would the when the acharyas say the veda is the basis krishna says is the basis everything's rooted in the veda why would we look at it that it's i found i found a fault in the veda but how do you know that you're not mistaken by the four qualities of the conditioned soul? How do you know that that's there? Because does it ever, it means, to base it on the Veda means, okay, he wants to follow the Dharma, right? So the Dharma is, then, is explained in the Brahmanas. It means the Brahmanas then, their subsection is the Dharma Sutras and the Griya Sutras. So from there you get your samskars and then your, all your Dharma Shastras come from there is everything's connected back to the Veda. 
So then in that, he's simply looking at the external's point of that. But what's the whole point? The point is to ultimately please Krishna. Why do you respect the superiors? Arjuna's on the battlefield. He's saying, no, we have to respect superiors. We have to protect the, you know, the, the whole social structure like that. But what's his purpose? It's for his own benefit. It's not actually for spiritual benefit. It's not to please Krishna. That's the modes of nature. That's, that's being under the modes. That's following the Veda, being under the modes. But then after Krishna explains what is spiritual understanding, then he follows those things in connection with pleasing Krishna. Because if we look at it, okay, Bhishma and, and, and Drona are his superiors, but who's their superior? And if you keep going back, then who's the most superior most? That's going to be Krishna. Right? And so that val what he owes them, he actually owes Krishna. So when you see it all the way back and you see how to connect it all the way back, that's actually the transcendental position. But if we only see it in as much as its secondary aspect and don't see the primary, then it is material. But when you see the secondary connected to the primary, that's where it becomes spiritual. And then, having connected it to Krishna, then that's why Rupa Goswami says it should be favorable to Krishna, not just I've connected it, it should be favorable also. Right? Because Shishupal is connecting everything to Krishna. But it's not favorable. So therefore it's not called pure devotional service. It will get him liberation. But, you know, it's not going to be outside of that. Because it's not favorable. Does that make sense? So we have to make a distinction here between what is the, the modes of nature, what rises above the modes of nature, but what actually brings about devotion, right? We have to make that distinction. Otherwise, we'll think, okay, the Vedas are free from the modes, now that's perfection. But that's not perfection, that's liberation. That's still a material conditioning. That's still a material value. That we value liberation above bhakti. And so we see is that this is being dealt with here, and especially in 10th canto, this mistake is very much emphasized. Is that otherwise we think it's logic, it's uh, opulence, it's grandeur. This is, the, this is what makes it spiritual. Right? Because the form of it is what's important. Well, we see with the Braj Basis, it's not about the form. It's the attitude. And that attitude that they have, that's the topmost position of bhakti. And it goes against much of what we would define as proper bhakti. Because we think it's the form that makes it perfect, when it's the attitude that makes it perfect. And that's what's being brought out in the 10th in the canto. And so we're already getting into, sorry to distinguish, pure devotional service from mixed from 7, 8, and ninth cantos. Right? But then the quality of pure devotion and how that is there, what actually makes it pure devotion, then that the subtleties are given in the 10th canto. Is that okay? So, so yeah. Okay, yes. It seems to me that uh, through understanding Prabhupada that he very much wanted us to be in the association of devotees. However, there's this uh, attitude I feel like that's become rather prevalent of seeing the devotees as an obstacle uh, or you know, the devotees are the trouble, devotees are a distraction, devotees are at the very least unnecessary and so I'm kind of going to shut myself off and I'm going to do my own thing and I have Prabhupada's books and Sadhu Sangha means associating with the pure devotees. So I'm just um, trying to understand, it, you know, just going on that basis, if, if we're associating with the, the devotees and, you know, I have anartas and you have anartas and, you know, we're associating them, we're just, we're just swapping anartas basically. Like how is... Like how baseball is that, cards yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Okay. So basically, like, how is that... Uh, how, how, how does it work, you know? How is... It, you know, how does it work? It means, yeah. means that means if I have one card of kuti nati, is and how many cards of uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, 
uh, yeah, you know, of uh, uh, called Hridai Dalbaria, you know, does that, does that trade for since the, uh, um, the whole point is, is you, it means you're going to get the association with what you see, right? Because basically in this, you do have the element of the unseen when you're dealing with the devotees, is that you're getting a benefit by that if you deal properly. But the problem is, is it's what you see is what you're going to get. So if you see them in a mundane fashion, you won't get the spiritual benefit of associating with devotees. And if you see the spiritual, then, you know, it's just like, uh, I don't know, it used to be quite common, I don't know if it is anymore, you can say, in the contemporary environment, where you have that one devotee who's always happy and always likes being with devotees and always appreciates devotees and always works very cooperatively with devotees. Is that like, we'd have to find that like in uh, Madame Tussauds uh, Museum, or, or do those still exist? Uh, you know what I'm saying? So, didn't, this, despite what's going on, they see the devotional side of the devotee. Because you can see what it, they're doing. They're, they're there in the temple, they're chanting, they're trying to remember Krishna and all that. Now, is that a good thing or not? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So, that being good, then if you associate with that aspect, why won't it be good association? But if we find the faults in others, then that itself, that ability to just find faults only, not f for, for the purpose of finding faults, that itself is a fault. And so then, from that, then that will only develop an artist. So then if we say, but if I associate with devotees, then I won't get any benefit because they aren't a benefit. Actually, the point is, is no, you're not a benefit. And then, then in uh, Third Canto Bhagavatam, Kapila Muni points out that such a devotee technically you shouldn't, have, shouldn't associate with. Someone who bases their advancement devotional service on their material qualifications and they see their own benefits that to be gained in Krishna consciousness separately than Krishna, that's considered devotional service in the mode of ignorance. And Kapila Muni recommends that you're going to etiquette-wise behave properly with such a person, but you're never going to associate with such a person. They're just to be avoided. You're just, uh, you know, wholesale avoided. Because there's nothing to gain from them, because they can only find fault. Right? Because they're superior, they're always better than everybody else, so they can't find any good in anyone else. So you're technically supposed to avoid people like that. But this I so so then it's Krishna's grace that such people do stay at home and don't come to the temple because then it saves you having to make that choice. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's the whole point. So you see the good, you associate with the good. You see the bad, you, then that's what you associate with. So what you see is what you're going to gain. So for someone of that consciousness, is it better that they just stay away from the devotees? For That's the another thing. The point is, is if they're staying away, they're reading Prabhupada's books, they're chanting, they're trying to do something, that's always going to be a benefit. And then with time, as they get purified by the process, if they, you know, by being away, if they criticize less, then they can advance. Then it's a good thing. But if by being away they still criticize, then it's, it's, no, it's no benefit. Point is, is doing the recommended devotional activities is always a benefit, and criticizing the devotees, that's not a benefit. Right? It means if you're dealing with someone where you have a responsibility or you, you can in some way have an effect on changing their life and all that, then by finding a weakness then that's okay as long as you're trying to show what's the proper thing. If you're just pointing out faults and not giving solutions or not being able to give solutions, then that's, uh, that's just fault finding. Right? But if you can see the thing, show them what's the correct thing and what's the proper, the practical, then that's, that's better. And then that becomes appropriate when the attitude is right. Because as we said, if the attitude's not right, the result, the experience is not right. So we have to see that the attitude is also there, not just that I'm technically correct. It, it's, a, it's, it's a modern disease that I'm technically correct, so therefore I have a right to, 
you know, go and tell everybody what to do because I'm technically correct. But what about the attitude? That's totally not correct and that's part of it. And the ultimate goal is, is it to please Krishna? Or is it just, I found a position in which I can find fault? Because one of the principles of finding fault is, if I, if I find fault in someone, where does that put them in comparison to myself? Right? Lower. So that yeah, I elevate my position by finding fault. So if I can find fault with everybody, then I'm on the top. Right? You know, so it's just like that. That's just like that. Does that make sense? So, in other words, means one may, may have seen more of this kind of finding a weakness in devotees back in 60s, 70s, up until a bit into the 80s. That, uh, but everybody was, or most were, many were in the temple, committed to it, and they didn't see it as a fault. They didn't see it as, as criticizing. It was, there was something that was wrong, they saw it, they were able to deal it, because you weren't dealing with much ego here. Does that make sense? So like that. Now, in the contemporary environment, then since people, by their conditioning, are so self-centered and so insensitive to others and totally sensitive only to themselves, then, you know, the words you use, the other things, you have to be a bit more careful. Right? And in culture society, it's always been like that. But, you know, Lord Chaitanya's mission starts with the most fallen, so the first thing you do is go out and, you know, scrape up what you can out of the gutter, and that's where you start from. So you don't necessarily have refinement. So that roughness and all that, that may have been an element that people would use. But because everybody else was rough, it didn't matter. And then those who are a little bit more cultured, they would get upset and everything like that. And so then, yeah, you have to be careful. And then now, nowadays, then everybody feels they have a right to get upset. So therefore, you, you know, it's like preaching in, a, in, a de in the mine, minefield, in the demilitarized zone, you know, kind of like that. You know, you have to be very, very careful. Does that make sense? But the, the best thing is, the main thing is don't worry about it. You can do devotional service, you can associate with devotees, you find those devotees that you appreciate and associate with them and don't worry, you know, that you don't have a, you know, luxurious social scene because who does? Right. Does that make sense? Okay. So we'll end, uh, time's up, we'll end here. Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Samaveta Bhaktivrinda ki, Jai Natai Gaur Premanandi.